Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us here in Hollywood tonight, and a special thank you to all of our friends on Facebook who are joining us live online. My name is Jim Hollingshead. I'm the president of ResMed in the Americas, and I'm very pleased to be joined here tonight by two CPAP patients who are going to talk with us tonight about their experience on our new revolutionary CPAP product, ResMed's Air Mini. I'm joined by Jeff and by Arthur, and I'm also very happy to be joined by Dr. Mehmet Oz. Um, back in January, we announced at CES in Las Vegas that uh, ResMed had joined into partnership with Dr. Oz to launch a new company called SleepScore Labs. SleepScore Labs is using the highest technology to help everybody, consumers and patients, to measure and understand and better manage their sleep. And we wanted to, spe to pick the right date for this Facebook Live event here in Hollywood, and I thought to myself, what would be the right date for that? I think, you know, I have a feeling that Dr. Oz will be out here for the Emmys. And sure enough, <laughs> Dr. Oz won his eighth Emmy yesterday. Uh, and we're very happy for that. And for those of you here in the room, we're going to show it off a little bit later. Um, but right now, what I want to do is hand it off to Dr. Oz. You're very kind, Jim. I, it has been a great pleasure for me to start looking for solutions for a problem that I've been hearing more and more, and in fact, a thunderous amount of commentary these days about p problems with sleep. Probably the single most underserved problem we have in America is sleep, and I see evidence of it in many different ways, and we're going to talk about some of those briefly today, but I love the fact that there are answers out there that people don't understand, and, and if they did appreciate them, it would change some of the nihilism surrounding sleep issues. So uh, there's a nice picture of me here, but and once I'm done, the more fun part is understanding chronic sleep issues, which will be a quick discussion, and finally how to treat these problems. Everyone sort of knows when they got an issue, but you know, the action steps are what to do about it. So I want to start off by talking about a little study that we started last year. And it's not so little, actually. It was the single largest out-of-hospital sleep study of its kind ever done using sleep quality metrics. And that's actually why I was so proud to partner with ResMed, because I knew they had the technology. If only we could figure out a way of getting people to try it. So we did a study on two million nights of sleep. We actually gave away a million dollars worth of devices on my show, tried to get people to understand that if they could just take advantage of these insights they'd learn. So we, what do we know? 75% of people get less than seven hours of sleep. Big issue, I'll come back to it in a second. Women actually sleep a little bit longer, although both sexes are dramatically sleep challenged. 30 minutes of exercise, not a lot, can cut down or change the, the outcome by about 14 minutes. And finally, 50% of people, I'll say that again, 50% of people say they use two or more sleep devices. These are big numbers. Now they don't use them all at the same time, but you know they might be using a, a, a supplement plus some kind of over-the-counter product, maybe even prescription. So what are the problems that folks are complaining about? Overwhelmingly insomnia. They don't always know why, but insomnia is there. Sleep apnea, 14% of people know they have it, but as we'll talk about in a minute, that's the tip of the iceberg. Snoring, big issue. Keep spouses away. We, had, we did a whole show on spouses who can't sleep in the same room anymore, which is uh, not usually a good thing for relationships, but sometimes it's the only choice you have because of the, the cacophony coming from your partner's nose. And finally, restless leg syndrome. So when we start diving into these things, we start to look at some of the harder metrics. And I'm just gonna point out, when we look at two million nights of sleep, you figure out all kinds of things. We figured out, for example, coffee wasn't as bad. Jim, that was good news, I know, for everybody. You could have three cups of coffee and actually not pay much of a price for sleep. In fact, when you drink alcohol, within moderation, it actually seems to help your sleep. So a glass or two a night with friends, you know, relaxes you and probably takes you in the right direction. We also knew that there's technologies out there that work. Mattresses can result in 20 minutes of extra sleep. Uh, there are all kinds of subtleties about how lighting affects you. And when you're smart about these things and you realize that there's power in some of these newer ideas and newer technologies, you begin to implement them into your lives. And that's actually where my passion lies. How do you give people answers to the problems that they're plagued by? The image behind me is probably the single biggest example of sleep in America being underdiagnosed and causing loss of life, loss of limb. Sleep apnea, 40 to 60 million Americans, numerous studies have, have uh, you know, positioned that number. Three quarters of everybody, three quarters, 75%, don't know they have it, which is sort of shocking. You might say, how did you not know you're suffocating all night long? But sleep apnea, to be super clear, is like railroad cars slamming into each other all night long, up to twice a minute. 120 times an hour. And not surprisingly, when you stop snoring and start suffocating, your body doesn't like that. Now we've looked at all kinds of paradoxes in sleep. We looked at the effect of sleep when the election happened. Not a good result, by the way. We learned that people were stressed out about the election and still were months later, and it was impacting on, the, on how they slept. But this is one of those issues that's a structural problem. It happens because you often have looseness, if it's obstructive sleep apnea in the muscles of the neck. You can be skinny 
and as a rail and still have sleep apnea. And when it's out there, it does a lot of things. For one, it causes this constellation of sometimes catastrophic mixes. Now I'm gonna go through these super quickly, but I want you to remember them. Diabetes, which affects probably pre-diabetes, one in three Americans, true diabetes, just under 10%. Increases the chance 72% of type 2 diabetes. Morbid obesity. The really big folks, 77% increased incidence if you have sleep apnea. Shockingly, stroke increases. You might say, well, how's that possible? Well, if other things aren't working right, your brain often pays the price. And then over here, a couple of things that no one would have expected. Irregular heartbeats. Millions of Americans suffer from atrial fibrillation. Seem to be related to sleep apnea. Heart failure, something that I manage. I'm a heart surgeon, so I see quite frequently. And this last point is high blood pressure. There are a lot of people in America who have resistant blood pressure. You're, it's so high you can't deal with it. Why is that important? It's the number one cause of aging in America. And when you can't get it down with medications, it is really mystifying. It turns out sleep apnea is associated with that. What if, what if dealing with sleep apnea helped you lose weight, helped get your blood pressure down, dealt with your diabetes? Imagine the impact on the healthcare budget in a world where we're all fighting Republicans, Democrats. This is an American problem. And if you can fix this at home, you ought to fix it at home. So with that in mind, we just get into this reality of what holds people back from getting treated. 65% of Americans say uh, that CPAP is a problem because of its size as, and when you're traveling. So that's a problem that it's not hard to imagine a solution to, but it's actually hard to deliver a solution of. And as a heart surgeon, I know it's not gonna happen in my office. So you look for technology partners, people who have instincts and insights to allow this to happen. So with that in mind, I thought I'd talk to a patient. Um, Jeff flew all the way here from Rochester. Mm -hmm. uh, how'd you sleep on the plane, by the way? I did not sleep on the plane. I just can't. <laughs> yeah. Just checking. We had stewardesses watching you. Uh. Yeah. We had cameras on you the whole time. It's part of the reality show. It comes up next. <laughs> Jeff on a plane. Um, <laughs> I get asked the strangest questions on planes. I'll get to that later. All right. uh, but I wanted Jeff to speak a little bit in your own words uh, about how sleep apnea has affected your life. How did you figure out that you had the problem? We want to hear your story because you speak for millions of Americans. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess the best thing to say is I can start with the idea that I probably had sleep apnea for over 20 years. Uh, I'm married, uh, my wife is a nurse, and she diagnosed me with sleep apnea many, many years ago, but I'm a very stubborn man. No. And, and it happens. And, <laughs> and for the, I just refused to do anything about that. As a matter of fact, she had told me that my wife is a registered nurse, and she actually took a, an oximeter and put it on my finger and found out I was running at about 85% oxygen. So, you know, Whoa. of course now, I don't know what that means because I'm not a medical person. However, she did and she, you know, I would say she, she tried her best to get me to, to get this taken care of. Um, it didn't affect me too much in the beginning, but I would say probably about 10 years ago, that's when I really started to notice that um, I'm waking up with a headache and you know, it didn't impact me too much, but it kept, you know, they, it just got worse. Uh, three o'clock in the morning seemed to be a, a, a time when literally I would wake up with, a, with, a, with almost like a migraine, where I would have to go in, I would take some, some ibuprofen, go and take a really hot shower with the lights off because I couldn't stand the light, and do that for about a half hour just to see if I can get back to sleep. I started missing some work after, after a while, so it really affected that right there, I had, a, and I had a stressful job at that point. Mm -hmm. So with all that being said, I knew that there was something that I need to start doing. And I, I reached a, an age where uh, somewhere in my, my mindset was that 51, that's that date, that's that year that just seems like you just read in the paper that so-and-so just dropped over dead and they were 51 years old. And I realized it was at this point, I really got to start taking care of myself. So you know, once, I got di once, once I registered for a uh, sleep test, and they know, they, when, it, when it all came back, I was experiencing anywhere between 35 to 45 episodes an hour. So it was extreme apnea. Um, once I got my CPAP, it, it, it really made a, a, a huge difference in my life. And that I will say for, for myself. The, the headaches were gone, uh, a little more energy, but even more important would be the fact that my wife was not getting any sleep. I mean, she was literally kicking me to, to, to wake up or to, to breathe again. So once I got the machine, my wife slept better. So, and that just made it, I mean, let's face it, that's, that's a good thing. So for, for me and for my wife, the idea of, of getting, getting diagnosed, 
doing something about it and then sticking to it uh, by using the machine has made uh, a, a, a wonderful difference in our lives. So, so it's, it's, it's a virtuous cycle. Yes. Which we see in families all across the country. Now, this issue of knowing what you got and treating it is what's perplexed me both as a practicing heart surgeon but also as a TV host. In your case, you realized that sometimes you couldn't use a device because you were traveling. So you were given a device, which we're going to talk about in a minute. I'll let uh, that, you know, that, that, the pros will handle that. <laughs> People know a lot about this technology. You've studied it. But I want to understand how it changed your life to have a portable device, and did it work for you? Well, one of the things about using this portable device that made a difference for me was that, first of all, <laughs> the, the ease of just carrying it around. It's a, you know, again, I, I, I told somebody, it's about the size of a, like a large eyeglass case. So just being able to put that somewhere in, in, in your bag and whatever and be able to take that and pull that out, um, it, it's like, now it's like, it, instead of having to try to figure out what you're gonna, you know, how you're gonna pack and all that, it's, it's so easy. You know you can take your CPAP and, and use it without, without having, okay, what, what am I not gonna be able to take on this trip? So that was one thing I would say um, had, it made a big difference for, for myself. Thank you. So now the mystery's over. Uh, Air Mini, that's what you decided to call it. Jim, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Thank you, Jeff, for sharing your experience. I'm holding in my hand the Air Mini by ResMed. And for those of you who have seen a CPAP device before, the first thing you'll notice is this is very, very small. This is the world's smallest CPAP device. Um, but we've launched it with all of the technology that we have in our regular nightstand devices. So it has all of the modes, the auto set modes, the CPAP modes. It has a mode called auto set for her in here. It's a very sophisticated device. Um, it's revolutionary in a couple of other ways. It's been designed as a system. So those of you in the room will be able to look at uh, the mask system and so on. It has inline waterless humidification. So if you're traveling with it, you don't have to take your humidifier. You don't have to look for distilled water when you land and get to your hotel. The humidification without water works very, very well. It works best with our latest masks the N20, the F20, and the P10, so it works with our latest technology, and it is managed by an app. The patient can, you can see an on-off button here. The patient can use the therapy just with that on-off button, but with the app that's available with it, the patient can monitor their own therapy, understand their sleep score, get contextual videos for help, and manage their own therapy very, very effectively. Now, that's all important because, as Dr. Oz has said, 65% of CPAP wearers say the reason they don't travel with their device is it's too big. And what ResMed is trying to do is make therapy available to everybody, everywhere. So I want to turn and ask uh, Arthur to tell us about his experience, both before and with the Air Mini traveling. Well, first of all, that was, uh, I've used that for a week, and it's just been kind of a, a miraculous little device, the experience I've had with it. Uh, just to give you a little backdrop, my, uh, my wife, similar to your, your wife, uh, also dealt with uh, the snoring for many years, and I always had the belief that everybody snores, particularly men even snore even more. And so I just figured that my wife would have to tolerate that because all men did that. And so what I got used to over the years, prior to ever having any sleep therapy, was uh, certain nights sleeping in the front room because that was where I was asked to sleep because of <laughs> my wife staying up all night. Uh, there were other times where we would start watching a movie together, and I'd have to ask her the next morning, how was the second half of the movie? Because I usually fell asleep before the movie was over. And that was kind of part of her lifestyle. And we'd go out to dinner with friends, and uh, while they were having dessert and coffee, I would go sleep on the couch, because I never made it to dessert and coffee. So I just figured that's how, how it was. And how I actually got diagnosed was, uh, I'm a former marathon runner. I run about 10 marathons. 15 half marathons, and my reward for that was three hip surgeries. So the first <laughs> surgery, I was uh, pre-diagnosed uh, for sleep apnea, and the people said to my wife, it's taking your husband a long time to come out of recovery in the recovery room. It's, they said, does he have sleep apnea? And she said, well, he does snore a lot. So right after that surgery, I went and got my test, and it turned out I was diagnosed for 40 events per hour, which is pretty serious. Mm -hmm. uh, I got, got a machine and I put it on and I looked at it and I said to my wife, will you still love me because this thing is not the most attractive looking thing and I will tell you that she loves me even more because she sleeps really well now. <laughs> when uh, I was introduced to the Air Mini, the first thing I did, I looked at it and I said, there's just no way. I mean, there's no way that's going to do what 
my, my other uh, resume machine does for me. But I took it on the road with me for the week. Uh, when you travel for work, for those people that travel, you feel like a camel sometimes. You're packing what you checked, what you didn't check, your laptop, your iPad, all the goodies. And, and then if you're like me, I actually did take my machine with me because what I always said was, you know, for me to be on my game in the next morning, I need to be rested. So I would never leave without that machine. And when this was put in front of me, the, uh, the Air Mini, I, I couldn't believe it. I just sort of packed it in the top of my backpack, just kind of shoved it in there. And it was like, oh my goodness, you know, I don't need to carry something bigger with me now. So I got to the, uh, the hotel, and you know, if you stay in hotels, there, there's not a lot of footprint on nightstands in hotel rooms, and uh, the bigger machine that I had took up quite a big real estate footprint. I put the machine on the nightstand, I put my Kindle next to it, I could actually see the, the little clock radio now because the machine wasn't blocking it. I had my phone, my cell phone there, and the first night I used it, I was amazed because normally what I would do when I would check in a hotel, I would look for a pharmacy or drugstore to get some distilled water. Mm -hmm. What a pain in the butt that is when you're traveling from the West Coast to the East Coast. Uh, and I kept saying to myself, you don't need any water for this because it has this little Humidex device that creates humidity and, and it makes you feel like you're getting that, that same feeling. And so I used it the first night, I put it on, and it was just absolutely awesome. I woke up the next morning, and I couldn't even tell the difference in the quality of my sleep. And because you could gamify your sleep with the app, I was quite blown away in a hotel room that I still hit in the high 90s my first night. And, and then uh, the next day, I think I got 100 with it. So it's, it's amazing, it packs well, it's light, and it does the job. So I'm real pleased. That's outstanding. So we wanted to open it up for questions. Uh, we've got lots of folks in the room here, and folks at home, please, we're here to be able to fuel as many as we can, and we'll go for as long as folks have the energy for. I know we're the only thing between most of the folks here and dinner. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you know, there's a microphone if you don't speak, mind speaking into the mic. So I see what sleep apnea causes with the AFib and the diabetes, but what causes sleep apnea? Is it a sinus thing? Is it a lung thing? Like, where does it, are you, oh, I'm sorry, so I'm, my name is Megan O'Brien, I'm for Harper's, but is it hereditary? Are you born with this? Do you develop it as you get older? Where does it come from? You like Roseanne, Rosanna Dana. This is fantastic. <laughs> you have a lot of questions. <laughs> so, but they're all good because that is actually the fundamental reality. There's two different kinds of it. There are a couple kinds of sleep apnea. The two main kinds are obstructive, and uh, which means that that's the main one where the, your, the passage of air that goes through your mouth into your lungs blocks off. Now, why does that happen? Tissues that surround our mouth, the oropharynx, are supposed to be in an arched uh, 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 environment. And when the muscles get lax, which happens with age, and genetics play a big role there, that begins to collapse down. Putting on weight also causes that. If you, if you remember the Pickwickian syndrome, which is what we would call it when I was in medical school, the Pickwick, Pickwick was a character in, in a Dickens uh, novel but he was overweight and big with a thick neck. So men over, who have neck sizes over the age of 17 inches are much more likely to have sleep apnea because the, the, the fat will put itself into the tissues and put a little extra weight on that arc. So the tissues begin to collapse under that. So you begin to sound like a kazoo. Now that's you know, one reason, but there are other related reasons. And to quickly answer your question, some are genetic, it's just bad luck. You get Delta hand, it's not so great, but you have solutions now that are you know, more than good enough to, to still let you win the hand. Uh, and uh, there's some things that are reversible. Losing weight's an example, but perhaps the biggest paradox is when you can't sleep, you will gain weight because your brain craves four things. Take notes here, everybody, four things. It craves sex, sleep, food, and water. So you guys figure out sex yourself. Like both you guys seem like you're in good shape here. You know, with, with you know, your wives who tolerate all that shenanigans and snoring and the like. Um, sleep you crave, uh, and if you don't get enough sleep, then you actually crave food. You, and you don't just crave any food, you crave carbohydrates. So people who are sleeping, you'll find this in your own life, you get woken up in the middle of the night for whatever purpose, you'll crave carbs, donuts, bagels, whatever's around, and you're voracious to eat them up. So paradoxically, the first thing you need to do, in most cases, to help with sleep apnea, is to put a, a device on, CPAP device, so it helps you lose weight. So maybe you don't need the device anymore. And that's just a little bit of a silver lining around this. A lot of folks with appropriate therapy might not need the device for the rest of their life. 
and th which is fantastic. So it's a, it's a crutch to get you in the right direction. But without that, you have all these issues building up behind you. You never can get back up. It's a life saver for a lot of people. Can I just add to that? And I, I'm no doctor, as you all know, but uh, there, there's a lot of information on our website available about the nature and the prevalence of sleep apnea. Um, the latest prevalence studies in the U.S. suggest that up to a quarter of American adults have sleep apnea that should be treated. So it's a massively underdiagnosed disease. Um, and and it's, it's a big health problem because of all the knock-on effects. And so it's, it's not necessarily hereditary. There are hereditary risk factors. The biggest measured risk factors have to do with aging and obesity. Um, but there are plenty of young people with sleep apnea, and um, it, it crosses genders. And so it's a big public health problem that needs to be addressed. I've got another question back here. Hey, Dr. Oz. My name is Johnny Jett from johnnyjett.com. So my dad's 88. He travels a lot with me. And bringing his machine is just a huge chore. He has severe sleep apnea. So my question is, where do you get it, and how much does it cost? Well, I'm going to turn this over to Jim. Uh, but I, I got to say, I, first of all, I'm glad you're traveling with your dad. That's probably why he's doing so well at 88. My dad's 91. And that's, that, that, that my biggest problem is not to see the apnea device. Uh, you know, but you know, fathers still give their sons a hard time no matter what age they are. But not being able to keep him safe is a crisis that we all have to face. And it's an underlying anxiety. Because I know what it means to have to go to a hotel and to find a pharmacy. That's not fun. That's not a vacation. Where you get it is through, your dad is probably working with a care provider who's a home medical equipment provider or a durable medical equipment provider. He can get it from, from his provider. Um, he'll also be able to get it through any of our, um, our approved online dealers. Uh, we're, tonight is our launch party, and so we're taking orders for this device from our channel partners tomorrow and we will be shipping it uh, sometime during May, by, the, by May 31st, and we're hoping to get it out sooner than that. Hi, my name is uh, Keith Herman from HealthWell PR, and I have a question regarding, uh, just in general, men are typically resistant and reluctant to go have these things checked out. It's very inconvenient. What advice do you give, since we're streaming here, to people that are watching? What kind of advice about the process to go through this and, you know, how, how difficult is it, how easy is it to be able to get diagnosed and to be able to get this device? Just, I'll give you one word of, of advice to everyone watching at home in particular about how to get the testing done. Then I want to hand it over to the pros here, the two patients who have gone through it. Uh, especially if it's for the man in your life, don't let them do it. Make the appointment, then it becomes a <laughs> task on their to-do list and they'll show up. It works, trust me, it's worked in my own life, my wife's done this to me, and I advise this to my audience all the time. Just make the appointment, the guy will show. If it's up to them to do it, they never get out of their own way because they're backing their way through life most of the time. So, a little thoughts on, on the practicality. Well, what I would say with this, because I am that person, obviously, um, once, once I realized that this is, this is, it's not going to go away. And the, the headaches that were, I mean, debilitating at some time. It, it made me realize that I need to do something now. It's not going to get any better. And again, I'm married. I, I prefer to sleep with my wife in bed, you know. You know? So, you know, with, with just doing that, it's, it's where, I mean, I think that I agree with Dr. Oz that, yeah, maybe your spouse should be, you know, uh, take an active role and make the appointment. But I would say for any guy that's out there that is, that is really struggling with sleep apnea, get it done. The, the, the test is simple. It's, you know, it, you don't have to go someplace. I, t I did my, my um, uh, test at home. And, you know, one night, sent the machine back to the people. They came back and said, yeah. You have severe sleep apnea. Here's a machine. They showed me how to use it. And that was it. very, very simple um, to the point where I felt, you know, like, okay, I should have done this years and years ago. Arthur, do you want to comment? Sure. I, I kind of equate it to an analogy. If you've ever walked down the beach and you get a pebble in your shoe, how many miles are you going to tolerate that pebble? before you bend over, untie your shoe, take the pebble out, put the shoe back on. That's about how long it takes to put the testing equipment on yeah. when you fall asleep. And then the next day, all that gets transmitted to whatever provider is going to diagnose you. So it, it's really much more of it's in our heads than really the experience of taking the proper action. And most importantly, being considerate to our significant other or spouse of the, what they've tolerated for all those years. So uh, that, that's kind of my take on it. Yeah, Jim, we have a flood of questions online, which is great, but the one that keeps recurring the most, in addition to how can I get it when, is why is it so good for travel? 
it's so good for travel because it is so small and convenient to carry. It, it, it weighs only 300 grams, which is about two thirds of a pound, which I was looking online before coming over here. If you have an iPhone 7 and a larger iPhone 7 and you hold them together, that's what it weighs. That's actually slightly heavier. So it's very, very light and easy to travel with. Requires no water for the humidification. And as, as uh, both Jeff and Arthur said, Jeff, I think you said when you went through TSA and you pulled it out, they said, where's the rest of your CPAP? Right. right? That's why it's great for travel. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Juliet Preston with Men's News. News. Um, so I was just wondering, you've talked about um, men being reluctant to get tested. How prevalent is it uh, with females? And do they have like different barriers for, for seeking help and, and getting tested? The, the latest data that I've seen, and again, go to resmed.com. We have a whole clinical section. And so just to keep me honest, okay, but the latest data I've seen is in the U.S., about 18% of adult women have some form of sleep apnea. So it's very, very prevalent. Um, and often, we were just chatting about this, you know, anecdotally, often what happens for women when they go in to see their doctor and they say, I'm tired, the doctor will say, oh, well, oh, you have a couple of kids or you're working and, you know, you're, you're, you're keeping home and you're, and you're also working, you're just tired and they'll prescribe something like an Ambien or something like that, which does not help this problem at all. In fact, arguably, and I'll defer to, yes. to Dr. Oz, probably makes it worse. So, a, you know, a very high percentage of women have it. In the world of therapy, the people on therapy tend to be about 60% men and 40% women. When we say that, people are often surprised because they don't realize how many women have sleep apnea, but it's a very, it's a very uh, regular problem for women to face. So if you go right now and Google, why am I? That existential question, why am I? People at home, please do this. It'll auto-complete, so tired. Mm. Gives you an idea, and I've tried this all, all over the world. My show's in 100 countries. I travel all summer long when we're not you know, taping original shows, and I just, it's ubiquitous. And I think a lot of people are so tired because they have a structural problem. So it's actually good news. Yeah, it's a little hassle. You gotta put a CPAP device on, but it's getting become progressively less of a hassle with small devices, but it changes your life. The, the idea that you might be on a slew of headache medications to cure your problem, yeah. right? Or Arthur, that you're on something because you're tired, right? you're exhausted, uh, you don't look as good as you should. I'm gonna give you an antidepressant, you must be down. And you're sort of down because you're, you're tired. <laughs> and then that vicious cycle continues itself. So, when we see these kinds of numbers, this is one of those things you do first before you default to the other reasons why you're tired. I'm Stacy Erickson Edwards and I'm from CPAPBabes.com. So we've been talking a lot about men, we touched on women. Um, what I'm wondering is as a woman, I started having symptoms at 15 and I've never really been overweight, really. Um, is that what I suspect is that there's chronic inflammation playing into it. Can you speak to where chronic inflammation or any other symptoms like that besides weight might play into sleep apnea? Sure, so I, I think inflammation is an important role because it makes everything sticky and mucusy. And I know folks who have gut flora that's not ideal for their body uh, face challenges across the board from the moment the air hits your nostril because your noses are running, you get more chronic sinusitis, probably inflammation around the airway itself causes issues. Then you go all the way down into the bronchioles and you get you know, asthmatic type symptoms with bronchospasm and the like. And then chronic inflammation in your lungs, you're coughing all the time. So it's not surprising that along that path, there's also a hindrance to air passing naturally. But I'm always surprised the number of thin women who have sleep apnea. And it's the exact opposite of what you expect. You expect an overweight, older man to have the problem. But when a young woman gets it, and you're not rare, you're not typical, but not rare, then I realize, geez, how can this not be on our checklist? We should be automating the, the self-diagnosis that all of us are doing anyway, going to Dr. Google, and including that as one of the top reasons. But for just to do the test, write it in there, why am I, and you'll see what happens. It should be saying, you know, so spiritual, or you know, bird-like or something, but instead, why so tired? <laughs> I think we have time for one more question before we wrap. We have okay, one more from sorry. online, Dr. Oz, if you don't mind. Oh, so sorry. We'll do, we have, we'll we'll do two. We'll, we'll do, do one. one online and then one in the Are room. you going somewhere? Are you in a hurry? <laughs> Jeez. I'm, no, I'm I kidding. I can do I'm this online. <laughs> I'm just being told what to do. <laughs> <laughs> no, he saw the bar back there. I know what's going on. The crowd cleared and he saw the bar. <laughs> so go audience and then online. Yeah. So. I'm Sri, I'm the editor of Sleep Review Magazine. I was curious since um, a patient said he had pretty much the same experience with the Air Mini as with his full-size CPAP. Do you think anyone would use this as their full-time CPAP? And why or why not? I was thinking of the cost savings of buying one device instead of two. Uh, it's, we're launching it with the intent of it being uh, a second PAP for people who travel. 
Um, and I think it's really up to the patient to decide how they, how they want to use uh, the therapy. It's certainly capable of being an every night therapy. Can I, can I add yeah, to and Arthur will comment. Yeah. So uh, for myself, I have a favorite chair in my front room that is very sacred to me. I take power naps on it. <laughs> and I use the Air Mini as my, kind of my plus one, my second one there, that when I'm home, I want a quality nap also, not just a quality sleep. And people that nap a lot, they, they, that have sleep apnea, they wake up from that. And I'll even add one other thing. On the plane coming back from New York last week, I actually use the Air Mini on the flight because it takes a very small footprint up on the table in the plane. And people that travel, uh, you know, West Coast, East Coast, or internationally, I mean, here's an opportunity to have a really great sleep on the plane. Let's face it, you're never going to see those people on the plane again anyway, so why worry about it? Just put it on, <laughs> have a really great rest, and then go home and be happy. So yeah. I, I think it's a great second device for home. Go ahead online. Yeah, so the last one was another recurring theme was, what would you say to those, and anyone can take this, Dr. Oz, you preferably first, what would you say to those who are scared or have trepidation of getting tested for sleep apnea? We're scared most of what we don't understand. And it is a recurring theme in health in general, but this is a condition which has a treatment that can sometimes alleviate the need for the device itself, but will certainly change your life for the better. And if you're leaving a wonderful, blissful 16 years, uh, 16 hours of, of a day because you wore CPAP overnight, I think it's a pretty good trade-off. Mm -hmm. Plus, when I see the litany, the, the laundry list of really serious, bad problems, and, and we didn't put death up there because we don't want this to be a downer, but that is there too. I've personally seen that happen in the hospital. Um, that I don't think is something we can play around with. I, now being on the other side, I guess would be the best way to say it, is um, there, there, there should be no fear. There should be more of a fear of dying than from getting, getting tested to see if you have sleep apnea. That would be, yeah, that, uh, I don't even know how else to say it. It's like, it's well you, said. Know, you you, you should never be afraid of getting diagnosed about something that's going to improve the quality of your life. Okay, well, with that, I think we'll close. Jeff, I want to thank you for sharing your experiences tonight. Arthur, I want to thank you. Um, and Dr. Oz, I want to thank you for coming out. Thank all of you for being here. Thank you for everybody watching Facebook Live. And that'll be a close to the event tonight. Thank you. I've got a prize for everybody who's here. Stick around.